This is 1988 Tops, where every card has a story to tell. Your hosts are David McKellis and Matt Kuzma. Let's play ball. Welcome back to 1988 Tops. David, what's our card for this week? Our card this week is Jim Eisenreich, outfielder, Kansas City Royals, card number 348. And why are we talking about Jim today? Jim was a suggestion from listener Jeff. Thank you, Jeff, who emailed in and said that Eisenreich had one of the more inspirational stories. And he overcame adversity to have a really nice career. Eisenreich has a Sabre bio by Scott Johnson. So thank you, Scott Johnson. When we initially set out to do this set, There were maybe 10 or so stories that I knew that would be surefire great stories. And I I figured Jim Eisenreich's would be right up there. So I I, I hope listeners are ready for a a good and motivational story from Jim Eisenreich. I think the world can always use a good and motivational story from the 1988 Tops podcast, David. So away we go to the front of 348. And we've got Jim, what I would call kind of the senior portrait baseball pose here. Jim's got his bat on his shoulder. The photo is taken in front of what looks like maybe it's taken in like a park. Uh, maybe there's maybe there's a water slide in the background. I can't it does really look like tell. a theme park. That might be like the zipper back there. Yeah, I'm trying to think of the theme park in Kansas City. There wasn't a Wally World or a uh, splash, Splish Splash or something like that trying to think of it maybe a listener from the kansas city area could help us out here what kind of water park jim's parked in front of here but david even more i would say this photo looks very much like photoshop and i know there wasn't photoshop in 1987 it looks very much like his cutout of his body and bat were stuck on a card a uh, picture of a field and not even a baseball field. <laughs> and his face almost looks like it could have been cut right around and pasted right on there. There's a clear line of his jaw. Look at this picture and the lighting in the back of the picture. And then look at the lighting and shadow on his face. The shadow is coming. It's as if the sun is directly above him. The shadow of his hat is projected down onto his shirt. But his face doesn't have any shadows on it. It doesn't have any shadows across it. But yet his face is very well lit. His face looks very smooth. This is a strange photo. I think that there's been some doctoring. It's also, again, the Royals theme here, the green and the blue. So much green and so much blue with all of that grass behind him, the blue jersey, the royal blue hat, the blue sky. A lot of green, a lot of blue in these Royals cards. I would say there's two two other features to note here. One would be the little tuft of hair coming out of the back of his hat. It, it portends well for whatever kind of hair Jim's rocking under there. And then what also looks like a tuft of chest hair popping out all the way up to his neck. So it looks like Jim's a hair suit f- fellow. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I have no notes. <laughs> Great. Then let's go to the back of 348. Pulling this up on the Jumbotron here. Jim Eisenreich, outfielder. Height 5'11", weight 195, left-handed batter and thrower. Drafted by the Twins in the 16th round of 1980. Born April 18th, 1959 in St. Cloud, Minnesota with a home in St. Cloud, Minnesota. According to Ancestry.com, the name meaning of Eisenreich comes from the Germanic Eisenreich, composed of Eisen, iron, and rich, powerful. So, a powerful iron man, Jim Eisenreich. He is from St. Cloud, and that's a weird name for a saint, and reminds me of David St. Hubbins from Spinal Tap. St. Hubbins, of course, the patron saint of quality footwear. But (laughs) St. Cloud is named after... Clodwald, and Clodwald was a Merovingian prince, grandson of Clovis I, and son of Clodomir, or Chlodomir. (laughs) And first of all, Chlodomir was a rejected baby name in my house. 
Clodewald, however, is a beautiful name. Clodewald <laughs> decided is. to renounce the royalty, <laughs> became a hermit and a monk, and he found a little hill along the Seine River. Among the fishermen and farmers, he led a life of solitude and prayer and built a church, which he dedicated to he dedicated in honor of Martin of Tours. And that place where he settled is now the town of St. Cloud in suburban Paris. And St. Cloud, Minnesota is named after that town in France. I don't know why. I don't know if there were some Frenchmen who happened upon St. Cloud, Minnesota. So I look forward to some St. Cloud, Minnesota history facts, if anybody's got some. As a youngster, Jim showed an early aptitude for baseball. However, he also started displaying some tics. His head would jerk, he would blink his eyes a lot, and cleared his throat excessively. Teachers thought that he was just being disruptive, and classmates teased him about his condition, and teachers thought that he could just stop it at any time, and he was choosing not to. Even doctors didn't know how to diagnose these symptoms. Because of that, Jim spent a lot of time alone, ostracized by his peers. However, when kids were picking sides on the baseball field, Jim was always the first one picked, and he was able to overcome his tics while he was on the baseball field, and he was a really good hitter. By the time he's a senior in high school, he's not very big. He was only 5'9", 140 pounds. But college scouts from St. Cloud State recruited him to play college baseball. He wasn't recruited by any professional teams, but the St. Cloud State coaching staff saw a great hitter, and they decided to bring him onto the baseball team. Some St. Cloud State alumni include a million hockey players, They were once coached by Miracle on Ice coach Herb Brooks, also John Hawks, who played Uncle Teardrop in Winter's Bone, and Richard Dean Anderson, TV's Mm. MacGyver. Yes! Jim made the varsity team as a sophomore, and he had grown a bit into his body, and he could still hit. He was all-conference his junior and senior seasons, and in that final year, he hit 385. He was a little bit overshadowed by teammate Bob Hegman, who was scouted by several professional teams. His coach at St. Cloud State, Denny Lorsung, on a whim suggested that the Twins think about drafting Eisenreich. So Bob Hegman ends up getting drafted in the 15th round of the 1980 draft by the Royals. He was the team's preferred prospect. He would only, in his career, play one inning for the Royals in 1985, and he never got an at-bat. But for Jim, we have a fun fact. And the fun fact is that Jim interrupted his studies toward a degree in geography at St. Cloud State University to play baseball because he got drafted. In the 16th round, so only one round after the preferred Bob Hegman, Eisenreich gets drafted by the Minnesota Twins, the local team. Nothing's guaranteed for a 16th round pick in 1980. He gets sent to rookie league. At Elizabethton, not the Kirsten Dunst movie, that's Elizabeth Town, and he hit 298. He was co player of the year in the Appalachian League and earned a promotion to Wisconsin Rapids, which definitely sounds like a water park. He hit 438 in a few games at A level, and in 1981, he was still at A level. Really good, hitting 311 and 23 home runs and 99 RBIs, so a lot of success on offense. His play earned him an invite to spring training, and he was really good at at spring training as well. So that earns him a spot on the Twins as their starting center fielder. They were really going through a youth movement at the time. And so this 23-year-old rookie gets a starting spot at center field for opening day. And that's a really meteoric rise from two years of low minor league ball to starting opening day for the Twins. And he started strong there, hitting 323 in his first 17 games. And then his childhood ticks came back. At the end of April, he was pulling himself from games because he couldn't control his facial twitches. The media started to notice, and that attention didn't help it at all. In fact, Jim said, when I think about it and try to correct it, I just make it worse. The more I do it, the madder I get at myself. When I forget about it and have fun, I'm okay. Jim's experience that season is really heartbreaking to read about. Prior to a series in Boston in May, the Boston newspaper did a piece about Jim's condition. So fans knew what was happening. All of the eyes in the crowd on TV were on Jim. 
Fans started taunting and jeering him. His symptoms in the field got worse. By the third inning of one of the games, he was shaking violently, hyperventilating, and removed himself from the game. During another game in Boston, he ran from the outfield to the dugout, tearing at his clothes because he couldn't breathe. He ended up going to the hospital. Doctors had to tranquilize him to calm him down. He ended up getting placed on the injured list. He attempted a comeback in June, but it it didn't work. And doctors still had no idea what to do with him. Jim said, I don't know what's wrong with me. No one else does. If I go to four doctors, I get four different opinions. He was given seizure medication. He tried hypnosis. Doctors suggested it could be agoraphobia. Really, nobody knew what to do. Yeah, so that 1982 season, you see on the card, he only played in 34 games, but had a 303 average. So without knowing that story, you just look and see, wow, this is a, what a great prospect. But here he was worried if he would ever play again or what would happen. As he came into spring training in 1983, he was hoping for a fresh start. And again, hit well in spring training, was penciled in as the starting center fielder. And two games later, he told the Twins he wanted to retire. The Twins suggested that he go on the injured list again rather than retire, maybe come back later. And he ends up going back to St. Cloud, playing softball with a local team over the summer, just staying away from baseball. When we later learn what what was actually going on makes more sense. But these early seasons, he was doing great in spring training when nobody was really paying attention. But as soon as he gets in front of a crowd, he starts to really get stuck in his head. 1984, again goes to spring training, again makes the team. And then... We've heard the story before. After 12 games, he, he announces he's retiring. The Twins try to convince him otherwise. They were really convinced that he was going to become a, a really great player. Calvin Griffith said of Eisenreich, a natural ball player like this might only come along once in a lifetime. So the Twins wanted to keep him. On June 4th, they attempted to send him to the minor leagues, and Jim refused. The Twins end up negotiating with Eisenreich, agreeing to pay him for the rest of the season if he just agrees to retire. The separation was pretty amicable considering the chances that the Twins gave him and Jim's seeming inability to get well enough to play. So in May of 1984, when it was clear that Jim wasn't going to be coming back, the Twins brought up a young outfielder to fill the gap from their minor league system and Some guy named Kirby Puckett came up as Jim's replacement. Wonder what happened to that guy. So now we have a break in the card because we have the 1984 season. He's got 12 games, played with 32 at-bats, 219 average, and then nothing for 1985, nothing for 1986. No minor leagues, no didn't play. So what did he do? He moved back to St. Cloud. He played for a semi-pro team. He worked part-time as a painter, and also worked in an archery shop, and he was studying forestry at St. Cloud State. He's retired all the way through 1986, and then at this point, his St. Cloud teammate, Bob Hegman, who got drafted around ahead of him, he had one game in 1985, and that was it. He was working in the Royals organization, and he heard that Jim was tearing it up in the semi-pro league. The Royals manager at the time was Billy Gardner, who had coached Jim in Minnesota, and... They had an idea that maybe there was a second chance for Jim. Billy Gardner was aware of Jim's situation from his time coaching in Minnesota, and he really wanted Jim to succeed. The Twins, actually around this time, tried to convince Jim that he should stop taking his medication because his medication was leading him to not be able to concentrate. And so while the medication was helping control some of his tics, it was hurting his ability to play on the field. So the Twins still wanted to keep him, still wanted to bring him back, and they they wanted to sign him to a AAA contract. But instead, we get the second fun fact of this way to the clubhouse that Jim was claimed on waivers by the Royals from the Twins October 10th, 1986, and began season at Omaha. The Royals purchased Jim's rights for $1. He is invited to camp, and at spring training camp, he told reporters that he had Tourette's syndrome. And it seems obvious now knowing more about Tourette's and Jim's symptoms and history, but his original doctor stood by his agoraphobia diagnosis. Tourette's is a nervous condition that causes people to have tics. Symptoms usually begin when a child is five to 10. 
The first symptoms are often motor tics that occur in the head and neck area. Tics usually worsen during times that are stressful or exciting, and they tend to improve when a person is calm or focused on an activity. There's no single test to diagnose Tourette's and there's no cure, but medication and therapy can help manage symptoms. It's often accompanied by additional mental, behavioral, or developmental disorders such as ADHD, anxiety, or obsessive compulsive disorder. Unfortunately, in pop culture, Tourette's has been portrayed as an involuntary use of obscene words or socially inappropriate words and phrases, often used as a joke, often used to make fun of a character. And that can happen, but it's pretty uncommon. Most people have symptoms like gyms where they tick or twitch or blink their eyes excessively. And most people can manage and cope with their tics, and it doesn't act as a barrier to personal or professional success. So at this point, at the end of 1986, Jim was starting to understand his condition and control Tourette's syndrome and wanted a chance, wanted a second chance at making it in the majors. He starts by being sent to the Royals AA affiliate in Memphis. Wait a minute, David. Do we, for two weeks in a row, have an incorrect fun fact? Let me check and make sure. Yeah, he played in Memphis double a in 1987 yeah the the fun fact that you just read said that he began season at omaha but matt he played in 1987 at memphis and he was really Mm. good and and it is an interesting fact about his career jim made it to the major leagues with two different teams without playing at triple a and omaha was the triple a affiliate he ended up there in 1988 but that's after this card was produced in fairness to the Tops Corporation, they ran out of space on this card. They removed a couple words that would have made the sentence flow better, and Omaha is shorter than Memphis, so maybe in, with not enough space on the card, they just kind of cut a corner there so they could finish the whole sentence. But regardless, that great play in the minors earns him a call-up to the big leagues in June of 1987. The Royals, while only finishing four games over five hundred finished second to the Twins in the AL West that year. And Jim had some pretty good performances, particularly considering he had been out of the big leagues for almost three full seasons. He hit 238 with four homers in 44 games. And most importantly, no drama of having to leave early or any other incidents. He wasn't fully satisfied with this season. He said, I know people are making a big thing about this, but I don't consider this a comeback. Not yet. If I can play the whole season and be successful, then I'll know I'm back. And 1988, he had some struggles. He was hitting under 200 in July and was sent to AAA, this being his first time actually playing in AAA, as he had skipped it the other two times. But he hit well and earned a recall, hit 271 over the last month of the season. 1989, Jim was 30 years old, but this is when his career really took off. Up to that point, he had played only 174 games over parts of five seasons. But in 1989, he played in 134 games, did much better, had a great start hitting 325 through May 31st. And the Royals end up winning 92 games that season, finishing in second place, seven games behind the A's. And this was a very good Royals team. But despite having George Brett, Bo Jackson, Cy Young Award winner Brett Saberhagen, the media voted Jim Eisenreich the Royals Player of the Year. He finished that season with a two ninety three average, seven triples, nine homers, and 27 stolen bases. And Jim would remain a regular contributor to the Royals over the next few seasons. 1990 and 91, he hit two eighty and three oh one respectively. He was awarded the inaugural Tony Canigliaro Award. This award is given annually to a player who best overcomes an obstacle and adversity through the attributes, spirit, determination, and courage that were trademarks of Conigliaro. Tony Conigliaro was hit in the face with a baseball that broke his eye socket in the 1960s after a really fast start, and he ended up coming back and playing for the Red Sox after that terrible injury, but wasn't quite ever the same. He was a a really great player when he was young, but never quite made it back after that terrible injury. And in 1990, this award was created. Jim was given that award for his courage in overcoming multiple retirements 
to make it back and to, to become a productive and great player in, in Major League Baseball. In 1992, he was used more in platoon situations, and his production began to drop off. He only played 113 games, which was fewer than the th- three seasons prior. Then entered free agency after that season. He had made $1.6 million in 1992, but now he's 34 years old, and so the Royals give him a chance to test the waters, and he signed with the Phillies. That first season, he only made $650,000, so a lot less, but he's still getting paid at age 34. It's kind of remarkable because I think most people thought that Jim was on his way down, but he really had a, a career resurgence starting with the Phillies. And this Phillies team, of course, would make it to the World Series. They brought in fan favorite Pete Incavilia and Milt Thompson. And Jim immediately felt comfortable with this team. It was kind of a clubhouse full of castoffs. You have your John Cruck and Lenny Dykstra, Pete Incavilia. In spring training, Jim's wife said that the first day, Jim was up until 4 a.m. because he was so excited about his new teammates. Manager Jim Fregosi said, Jimmy thought these guys were neat. Can you imagine that? Neat? I'll tell you who's neat. Jim Eisenreich. What a prince. Fergosi said, I can't speak for him, but I'm guessing that wherever he's been before, he's kind of been off to the side. He's quiet. So he might have been left alone. Not here. Nobody is spared in this clubhouse. Nobody. <laughs> and it seemed like there was a a joking conviviality in this Phillies clubhouse that maybe was probably not safe for work for most workplaces but Jim really thrived there and actually enjoyed it and enjoyed the ribbing that throughout his life he had been teased but here this was kind of a team setting that I don't know it it seemed slightly different yeah in a team full of castoffs a guy like Jim can fit in and what a what a great opportunity for him And it really showed in how he performed and how the team performed. He wasn't expected to be a regular in the outfield, but but it turned out that he played 153 games that year in 1992. Half the time as a starter, half the time as a late-game sub. He hit 318, and that was the first of four straight 300 seasons for Jim in Philadelphia. The Phillies won the East by three games over the Expos. They take on Atlanta in the NLCS. Jim only hit 133 in that six-game series, and that was his first taste of playoff baseball. But they make it to the World Series, and in the World Series, Jim played every inning of all six games. He had a good series. He had hits and RBIs in five of the six games, including a three-run homer that put the Phillies up 5-0 in Game 2. They would win 6-4, to four, so that homer was decisive in the Game 2 win. Unfortunately for the Phillies, they lost in six games, but it was a very good effort by Jim in his first playoff appearance. And that performance earned him a contract extension. He spent the next three seasons as a consistent hitter, but often the extra outfielder for the Phillies. He hit 300 in the strike short in 1994. 1995, he hit 316 with a career high 10 home runs. He was valued at 2.8 wins above replacement that year, which was the second highest on the team. He was that valuable despite the fact that he only started 90 games in the outfield. 1996 was his best year at the plate, even though he's 37 years old. He hit a pretty amazing 361 with a career-high 136 OPS+, but he only started half of Philly's games, and his at-bats were limited. Again, the second most valuable player on the team in terms of wins above replacement that year with 2.9. Just getting better and better with age, really incredible. Despite this production that just seems to keep going up, he was getting up there in age, and he was a free agent going into the 1997 season, and he signs with the Marlins. They signed him as a utility outfielder. They already had their three outfielders, and Moises Alou, Devon White, and Gary Sheffield. So Jim played some left field, played some right field, and played some first base. He hit 280. The Marlins take a wild card spot, and Jim's back in the playoffs again. He saw a little action, five plate appearances combined in the NLDS and NLCS, but he appeared in five World Series games, and in that World Series, he went four for eight and also had three walks, so a 500 average uh, for Jim in the in the World Series, and he hit a two-run homer in the Marlins' Game 3 victory. 
He was also on second base when Edgar Renteria got the series-winning single in the bottom of the 11th of Game 7 of that World Series. So Jim played a big part in that World Series win and a huge moment for a 38-year-old Jim Eisenreich. We're talking about 1997, and on the other half of the Jumbotron, I still have the back of the card up showing his rookie year in 1982. It's really incredible, the span of this career. He had retired 13 years before. (laughs) Twice. It's, It's just amazing. It's amazing. 1998 through 30 games, he was hitting 250 for the Marlins. And you'd think that I'm about to say he decided to retire, but no, folks. He was then part of a blockbuster trade. He may have just been thrown in because the Marlins needed to get rid of a little bit of extra payroll. Uh, <laughs> they, the Marlins were just in a fire sale at this point. Jim was traded by the Marlins with Manuel Barrios, Bobby Bonilla, Charles Johnson, and Gary Sheffield to the Dodgers for Mike Piazza and Todd Zeal. The Marlins then turned around and traded both Piazza and Zeal. So the Marlins are just trying to shed payroll. And unfortunately for Jim, he went to L.A. and hit only 197 in 75 games. At the end of that season, he's granted free agency, but he decided to retire after the 1998 season at the age of 39. Closing the book on Jim Eisenreich, 15 seasons in the major leagues, a 290 career batting average, over 1,000 hits, 221 doubles, 39 triples, 52 home runs, 105 steals. He finished his career with a 988 fielding percentage, playing at all three outfield positions and first base. In 20 postseason games, he hit 231 with two home runs, 11 RBIs, and seven walks. Never an all-star. I'm kind of surprised that he didn't get an all-star vote. I guess the timing didn't work out. What about in retirement? Jim has lived in Kansas City, in the Kansas City area, with his wife Leanne and four kids since retirement. In 1996, while he was still playing, Jim and Leanne started the Jim Eisenreich Foundation. And Jim travels the country talking to schools, families, teachers about Tourette's and his experience and how those folks can better help children dealing with Tourette's. The foundation provides resources for teachers, principals, counselors about how to address the special needs that children with Tourette's require. So you set this up as an inspirational story, and it certainly is. Overcoming a physical disability to achieve great things. But now that we've dug into it even more, what do we think? In in looking at this card in 1988, and then looking at the back of it, it's hard to notice those missed two seasons because there's no lines. Normally there's a line there that says injured, did not play, or something for 85 and 86. And there's nothing for Jim. I think what's most remarkable is this was the first year back for him, and it was the first of 10 years back for him, that he continued playing until 1998. It's just remarkable. Three retirements, two comebacks, a World Series ring. He had the confusion of not knowing what was wrong with him and the frustration of being unable to control his body. And for a professional athlete, that is your, your main skill as a professional athlete is the extreme ability to control your body. And at certain points in Jim's life, he couldn't. And it had to have been frustrating and frightening. And the unknown must have just been terrible. In the minor leagues, few people could tell what he was dealing with because nobody's really paying attention when you're at A ball. But when he got to the majors and the cameras and fans and people are really invested and can be cruel. In Jim's case, they pushed him into an early retirement. And after specialist visits and medication trial and error, Jim was able to get to a place where he was comfortable. And that level of comfort, along with medication, is what helped him continue his career and make millions of dollars playing baseball. And Jim said that he just wanted to be normal. And there's some real what-ifs with his career. He was skilled enough for the pros at 23, but he didn't play regularly until he's 28. If he had been diagnosed and medicated and treated with a level of greater respect by some fans, what would have been? How many All-Star games would he have made? Would he have been what Kirby Puckett ended up as, the center fielder of the future for the Minnesota Twins? 
Jim's medical regimen sometimes prevented him from playing every day, and he still played until he was 39 years old. And despite never having 500 at bats in a season, he had 1,100 hits in his career. He did receive three Hall of Fame votes in 2004. And there is this Bleacher Report article, and it had a list of, quote, the most ridiculous players to receive Hall of Fame votes. And they included Jim on that. And I don't think it's ridiculous at all. Jim has a Hall of Fame story of perseverance. His story should be a lesson about kindness and understanding and overcoming obstacles and also baseball greatness. Multiple seasons hitting over 300 after what Jim overcame is great. And I think that there's a place in the Hall of Fame for Jim's story. Maybe not next to Babe Ruth, but there's a definitely a place for Jim Eisenreich's story. Well, of course, because he has a card, we have room for his story here, but it's a very special one. So thank you, David, for bringing us that today. And thank you to you at home. If you were named for a Merovingian prince, we would love to hear from you on Twitter. We're at Tops1988. Thanks a lot, and we'll see you next week.